Good afternoon. Welcome to today's SCA webinar with Tom Roney and Pete Slaby on designing and optimizing and improving ENP asset performance. Before we start today's webinar, we'd like to ask a few questions about the demographics of the audience. So I'm going to select some polling questions. And the first one is, what's your primary discipline? So we're starting to get some responses. Looks like we have a good distribution between the petroleum engineers, the geoscientists, quite a few other in the audience today. So most of you have voted, so I'll go ahead and close and share those results. Uh, the 44% are geoscientists, 13% are petroleum, 31% are petroleum engineers, and 19% other. So the next polling question is, how many years of full-time experience do you have in the upstream oil and gas industry? Looks like we've got a wide spread of different answers. Answers are still coming in, but quite a few of you have over 30 years experience. We're still getting some responses. So I'll go ahead and close that poll and share the results. So 50% of you have over 30 years experience. Uh, the next group is in the 11 to 20 year experience with 25%. And then we do have some people with 21 to 30 years. We have 15% and one to 10 years, 10%. So I'm gonna hide that poll and go on to our last polling question. And this is about what time of assets have you worked on in the most recent five years? Looks like we've got uh, quite a few in the conventional onshore and unconventional offshore. We don't have anybody from thermal so far, no thermal or heavy oil participants, but everything else is covered. So I'll close that poll and share the results. You can see that 45% of you have worked conventional onshore in the past five years, 36% have worked unconventional onshore, and 18% have worked offshore shelf or deep water. So thank you for that. Uh, before I introduce Tom and Pete, I'd like to remind the audience today that you are muted, but you can ask questions during the presentation using the GoToWebinar question feature. We'll cover the Q&A at the end of the presentation, and you will be anonymous. So I want to make sure I'm sharing my desktop, and I'm going to go into our opening slides here. So again, you're in SCA's webinar series, and this topic is based on the uh, drilling, optim designing optimiz optimization and improvement of ENP asset performance. And our first speaker will be Tom Maroney. Uh, Tom has spent over 35 years in the upstream oil and gas business, uh, including R&D. Uh, his experience includes uh, his most recent work at Flores Energy LLC, where he's a managing partner. Prior to that, he was involved with directing technology at Chesapeake. And you can see he had quite a few leadership positions at Shell in various areas around the world. Um, he's got quite a bit of expertise in identifying technology. He's worked both onshore and offshore. We'll talk a little bit about lean manufacturing and operational excellence. Uh, he does have expertise in both digital operations and advanced analytics and integrated asset management. Pete Slyby, our second speaker, has also had a long career in the upstream oil and gas industry. He's also a partner currently with Flores Energy. Um, He's currently an independent director at Glacier Oil and Gas and served as a director and chair of the Alaska Oil and Gas Association. 
He's a co-founder of Quartz Energy Upstream and had several positions of increasing responsibility with Shell uh, in the final years working in decommissioning and restoration. And so he's going to share his expertise on business turnarounds. Again, the topic of integrated asset management will be covered. He's worked in policy and strategy development, Arctic exploration, and um, again, his expertise in decommissioning and restoration. So we're introducing to you today Tom and Pete, who have expertise in improving EMP asset performance, and they're offering through SEA mentoring and consulting services. And so their focus is really on stressed asset turnarounds and looking for opportunities to uh, safeguard your investments through uh, hands-on operational management of your assets. And they can apply a systematic approach to managing your assets through their consultancy process. And they'll take you through their system of people, process, technology, and culture that they can deploy to reshape your critical operations. They also have partnerships that they have expertise in, in organizing. Uh, so that you and your uh, joint venture partners can make sure that you have uh, your work products delivered uh, efficiently across all types of production systems, both inflow and outflow. And not to mention, in the future, we have two other free webinars that are coming up. Uh, we have Dr. Nathan Meehan, who will be speaking on Tuesday, March 16th, on the energy transition, the next step to net zero. And then we have Eric Carlson uh, giving us a quick tour of the Big Bend field trip he leads for SEA on normal faulting at the Santa Elena Canyon. That's in April, so put those on your calendar. And remember SEA, when you're thinking about consulting, direct hire services, projects and studies and training. And so I'm going to give the presentation rights back to Tom. Okay, so you should be good to go. Okay. Whoops. Well, let's put that in presentation mode. Fantastic. Okay, looks good. Hopefully that looks good. Um, good afternoon, everyone, or good day. Thank you, Susan, for the kind introduction. As Susan's mentioned, Pete and I uh, are absolutely delighted to be here uh, with the community, uh, with the SEA community. Uh, part of the SEA consultancy family. And as Susan has mentioned today, Pete and I will take you through two examples of our strategic capabilities that we provide as, as Floris Energy in partnership with SEA. Uh, they are, as Susan's already pointed out, focused on integrated asset management. I will take you through an example of uh, our systems approach to improving integrated asset management. And then Pete, um, we'll take you through uh, an example of a stressed asset uh, scenario that we uh, became involved in and had a uh, deep look at. Look, look at. So Susan has already given you a, a brief uh, bio, um, but before getting started, I do want to mention uh, several of our other florist principles. Uh, certainly, several of them uh, that they're thinking contributed mightily to some of the work that you're going to see today. And so let, let me just mention their names for the group: uh, Ernst Denhartik. Arthur Perpich, John Mulbrick, John Mercury, and Bob Palermo. Uh, many of you may be familiar with the names. Uh, they are part of our family and then as well part of the SEA consultancy family. Okay, so without any further delays, uh, I think it's time that I uh, get into the content and start, uh, start our discussion here. So I'm just, there we go. Fantastic. Okay, so the uh, Important here that we set the scene uh, and establish a case for action. Um, so again, this systematic integrated asset management improvement effort was focused on a large Gulf of Mexico operator who had a broad portfolio, broad mix of greenfield and brownfield developments. And so our teams working, or the, the teams working uh, the greenfield assets, the development assets were focused on competitively designing, scoping next generation projects, improving the cost and pace of development, leveraging existing infrastructure, seeking out standardized equipment designs from either the global inventory or working with contractors uh, to drive efficient management of all phases of project execution, 
all the things that you might imagine would go into play in a, in a greenfield scenario. But in developing these next set of frontier assets, uh, the reservoirs uh, and the pro projects were getting extremely complex, very difficult to both exploit and to operate. Simultaneously, the portfolio was also blessed with, with a broad uh, array of uh, brownfield assets, uh, where we were continually pressed, where the operator was continually pressed to safely and efficiently maximize production on that existing asset base. So there the focus is on things such as maximizing runtime across the integrated production system, delivering the most competitive barrels uh, through uh, integrated asset management by sweating these assets, investing in asset integrity as things approached end of life, targeting unit operating costs, continuing to drive those down, all in an attempt to seek radically different ways to reduce costs, improve volumes, without compromising safety. So the challenge with the brownfields was to continually sweat the installed asset base efficiently and effectively, and thereby presenting its own unique set of challenges, certainly when you overlay that on the greenfield assets. Now, what we were witnessing, or what the operator was witnessing, oops, let's advance the slides, is all of our critical, all of the critical leading and lagging indicators were trending in the wrong direction and slipping away from the operator. And we can walk through several of those uh, on this slide. So if you look at the far left, you've got three sets of some of your most important critical metrics in terms of resources, uh, personnel resources. And in this case, they were tracking uh, persons, on, uh, persons on board, uh, out on the offshore installations, uh, the middle chart was a typical look at uh, the cost pressures from unit operating uh, costs uh, across the fleet, and you saw that uh, rising. Uh, so whether you were looking at well maintenance expenditures, facilities maintenance, pipeline tariffs, overhead, or uh, the remaining surface expenditures, those were continuing to provide extreme cost pressures. And then when you looked at reliability uh, and you zeroed in on what was happening uh, in the most current two years, uh, you saw a lot of concern with reliability and equipment failures, asset integrity shut-ins, a lot of major project work that wasn't scheduled properly, and then uh, serious issues with wells loading up. So all of these critical metrics, again, as the headline message says here, was, were heading in the wrong direction. Uh, staff and human resources were focused on reacting to the problem rather than being able to get out proactively in front of the problem. You had also the issue of demographics and ways of working also headed in the opposite direction. Um, and we weren't doing an effective job uh, in terms of transferring knowledge from the very senior staff to the very young staff that was coming on board. So all of this created uh, a very urgent case for action. Was there a way that we could rethink, right? that we could rethink how we manage our assets. How do we deliver high class, highly efficient, highly effective integrated reservoir management in such a way uh, that we could shift from being reactive and being in a proactive mode. The fundamental, uh, fundamentally what we believed was we needed to turn all of our assets into an information factory that we needed to convince the operator that these assets were living, interconnected, integrated systems that were constantly pulsing out signals. And the, issues, the, the issue would be, are we listening closely to the right signals in a way that we can proactively intervene? So, you know, the, the message here is once an operator invests billions of dollars in connecting highly complex reservoirs and containing thousands, millions of barrels of hydrocarbons under pressure, connecting those up to wells and the subsea equipment to top to risers and top size and processing equipment, ultimately to a sales meter. You have set in motion, the operator set in motion, a very dynamic, uh, dynamically performing system that is constantly speaking to the operator in real time. The question is, are you listening uh, in fairly sophisticated ways to those signals? So the challenge was, 
how do we think more systematically in a way that we can harness and interpret those signals into meaningful insights to, into situational action and actually drive action that leads to value capture and value creation and turn around a lot of those metrics. So the fundamental belief that we brought to the operator was overlaying a dynamic system of rigorous decision uh, making and a decision methodology on top of uh, the notion of the, uh, on top of the set of challenges around running and optimizing a complex uh, integrated production system such as we just described. And that could be again the strong investment case where that we shift from a reactive into a proactive management system where we are tuned to all of the interconnected technical and business risks and that we are focused on driving strong cash flow day in and day out. And so this diagram where you look at your assets, the data, the analysis, and the plan was that, was that fundamental rigorous decision methodology that was used to overlay on those complex systems. What is the assets? What are the critical business and technical risks? How do we optimize those assets? What is the data plan? What is that plan to go out and in a sophisticated way, pick up on all of those critical signals, right? On the most critical signals such that you're, you are detecting anomalies in performance. How do you go about modeling, looking for a better answer, looking for a better outcome? What are all the models that you need to have in place? What are all the uh, analytics that need to be applied against all of that data that's being streamed in? And then that ultimately should lead to a set of plans that need to get executed in a way that you then go back and improve that asset. So that is, again, then the dec rigorous decision framework that got overlaid on top of your complex integrated production systems. Fundamental to that uh, detection uh, methodology was thinking about how that we could actually get upstream of an anomaly that would occur, be it uh, a loss in well production or a loss in uh, uh, productivity, uh, be it not getting connected to a certain part of the reservoir, be it a piece of top size equipment. The solution that was ultimately designed wanted to take it further back than just simply using threshold alarms. Threshold alarms are really not sufficient to truly be in a proactive stance. Threshold alarms are really gonna allow you just to react to an emergency and know that you've got an emergency and probably a piece of equipment or a well potentially has to be take, uh, taken offline and some work planned and scheduled. We wanted to actually get upstream of that and that is how you could actually get to a, uh, get to a place where you could actually optimize the system, right? So it was understanding what was that critical window window that you wanted to operate in, but beyond just the window of performance, how do you, how do you actually find that optimum point within that window such that you're driving performance at its most uh, most productive in its most productive manner each and every day. So fundamentally, we wanted to, to we were advising the operator that this detection methodology was a way to really take that shift and move from reactive to proactive engineering detection. So I'm going to spend some time now on talking about one phase of the solution. As you might imagine, um, there were organizational aspects to this solution, there were technology aspects to this solution, there were workflow aspects to the solution. What I am focused on now is very much talking about the technology aspect, which was developing a remote operations center where we used some third party analytics software to drive that detection engine to pick up all of the data that was coming off of all of the assets in the Gulf of Mexico, such that we could bridge this gap to action. And so the creation of an, 
uh, of an anomaly detection capability that was anchored in a remote operation center connecting all the assets out in the Gulf of Mexico. And eventually, the operator was convinced to connect it to some of their other deep water provinces. And again, with the goal being to proactively detect system performance anomalies that threaten runtime of equipment or production output. And rather than going through a fairly complex slide, which in this case shows an example around a compressor, I'll just describe in general some of the critical aspects of the solution. So advanced analytics, obviously fundamentally important, right? So there was a, a system uh, that was a third party system that allowed uh, the operator to do some sophisticated data cleansing, uh, code in some the, the the set of analytics that they needed to again detect the certain anomalies. There was a workflow orchestration engine where workflow was then role based with standard operating proceed procedures representing the best practice remediation techniques. Everything was simplified, standardized, consistent, with a focus on closed loop traceability. Very much predicated on a lot of lean principles. Another aspect of the solution was creating visibility and situational aware awareness. So you see a lot of visualization of the integrated production system. You could look at how workforces were being used. You can easily see what the conditions were across the full fleet of offshore assets. And then finally, there was absolutely an aspect of this that was about knowledge capture and management getting the right information to the right people connected in a way that they could drive the right decisions, thereby enabling a lot of cross-asset best practice sharing. Final slide for me uh, on, on this solution, and again, this aspect of the solution that led to improved integrated asset performance is, is around the value that was captured, right? And, and how the system actually performed. Two big outcomes around strengthening the connectivity between the engineering function and the operational function, creating a stronger operational intimacy in the office environment. And there was absolutely a much better deployment of the deep technical expertise. We were able to get those folks, get their head up from their desk, get them out of the mode of, of data cleansing and moving data around to actually applying their expertise to develop some sophisticated solutions. So in terms of you know, what the system was able to do, in any given day, it was handling upwards of 400 million uh, individual data elements. It was driving something on the order of 300, over 300,000 analytics per day. There was something like 20,000 uh, pieces of instruments that were, that were monitored, uh, a number of event conditions. Uh, conditions, something like 10,000 event conditions that were actively searched for and looked, again, so that we get upstream of the issue. So just thinking about some of those metrics, you can see the tremendous uh, leverage that was enabled by technology. All of a sudden, we do every day that 17,000 pieces of equipment were getting handled, and it wasn't dependent on whether a person was in the office, not at a training class, all of these analytics were getting run regardless of whether someone was behind their desk and uh, uh, happened to be in their Pi database uh, running their own models. As much as possible, all of that modeling and all that analytics was automated to drive uh, the proactive nature. So again, in terms of a couple of the, the, the big outcomes around unlocking value from data, absolutely uh, tremendous. Uh, getting the analytic strategy was right, excuse me, getting the analytic strategy right was absolutely critical to unlocking the value from data. So that was a absolute key step here. And then the notion of simplifying and automating workflows and automating business processes, applying lean thinking, just in time, standardized workflow, that also eliminated a lot of waste in the system and actually drove a much higher level of efficiency with the staff and actually allowed a lot more work to get done. And I see there's a, a, a slide here uh, that actually shows, I think this has been all normalized uh, because you know, we can't uh, 
get into a lot of the the the, the real numbers here, but it just uh, it shows shows you the payout on the investment. And this was specific to the investment around the digital center, the remote operations center. Um, so within a matter of of you know a little bit over a year, you paid out the investment, uh, and the investment was on the order of I believe uh, you know tens of millions of dollars. Uh, and it continued to generate incremental value year after year after year. So the improvement in our ability to sweat our assets was absolutely uh, tremendous. So with that, I'm going to conclude my remarks on the work that was done here uh, to help this operator who was faced with a very complex uh, deep water uh, portfolio uh, that was challenged with their costs, challenge with their deployment of human resources, uh, challenge with what they were seeing in terms of reliability performance. And by rethinking their approach to asset management, predicated on that model of the asset, the data, the data plan, the analysis and the analytics, and then the plan to execute, and then leveraging technology to actually deliver that solution in real time each and every day, fundamentally rechain their approach to sweating their assets and deliver tremendous value. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Pete, and he will now take you through the stress asset turnaround, and then we will get to a point where we can entertain some questions. Hey, thanks, uh, Tom. Appreciate it. Appreciate the uh, presentation. Uh, good afternoon. Good day, everybody. I'm, I'm going to uh, talk about uh, two topics with two themes. Um, so we'll discuss marginal fields and really looking at marginal fields from one end of field life, the, uh, the development. And we'll talk a little bit about end of field life. The premise I have is that uh, marginal fields end of field life are all actually related. Uh, they are, they're both working a, a certain part of uh, of what every what what most fields will go through, even the biggest fields at the end of their lives go through periods of, of challenge. The second theme that I'd like to discuss, and that's appropriate, Tom and I are sitting in the SCA training suite uh, here in Houston, is that uh, to be successful in in this area requires some really what I would call joined up thinking. People who are successful at looking at these problems generally are, you know, obviously the, uh, the bright bulbs that can do the technical and operational thinking are, are very, very important in the discussion. But it also involves, it's a tripod, it involves two other legs. Uh, uh, to a large extent in this endeavor, you really need good commercial thoughts. You know how to construct, uh, construct deals, construct uh, uh, a way to put all this stuff together. And I've noticed when uh, Susan did the survey, there are a lot of folks on this call who are no doubt now being absolutely challenged in getting investors in conventional and unconventional wells in this low price environment. So you, you know what I mean by that, and you really need to be um, an order of magnitude more tuned in to what's gonna work commercially. The third leg, when you're looking at both marginal fields is the regulatory. Uh, um, point of view, and that's marginal fields are in the field life. Regulators play a huge part in this role. I'm going to talk a little more about that, but it's become increasingly difficult. As we we are discussing now in 2021, we've seen a change in administration. We, uh, we know that there's going to be challenges in the oil and gas uh, industry, and we've got to be ready for that. So it requires a level of collaboration around a, a number of operators and really an open and honest dialogue with regulators about either justifying new fields or responsibly, which is something we owe to the places we work, responsibly putting together end of field life that uh, assure that we as operators do what's required to abandon assets, but yet do the right thing with respect to enhancing all the recovery of uh, the reserves we've been entrusted with. I would also uh, indicate uh, this, that uh, you know you need to be able to weave a, a, a lot of things together into this, uh, into this thing. As we've said, it's, it's technology, it's regulatory and commercial, 
and this has to be done in every in every scenario. And I'll tie back to Tom's point uh, here, where where he indicated you need to think about this and need to think about this somewhat uh, differently than you've done in the past. And I was on the other side as an asset manager when a lot of what was being done at the company we worked with was getting rolled out. We used to talk about uh, the 10% of the reserves in the ground or the production of the day that we were leaving behind because we weren't thinking about this different uh, in, 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 in the appropriate way. We need to think about this more systemically. And uh, this is, is really all about managing managing the, uh, the end of field life as well as thinking about how you're going to justify the, uh, the, the operations and the opportunities you have in front of you. Um, so it is, I, I want to talk about a specific case, which is actually the composite of a few cases, but I've on the upper right hand kind of summarized what it would look like again as a, uh, as a tieback, a uh, shelf type of tieback to a commercial uh, production center. And you look at what you would do to make this work. And in this particular instance, it had been a, a project you know, literally the can had been kicked down the road on this one a fair few times and people really needed to uh, to understand what was going on. So there are always things that you do and whether you're looking at end of field life or, uh, or new marginal fields, you, you're looking at uh, the activity, activity base, specifically when you're getting towards the end of field life, what are you going to do? What can you not do? How do you justify that? How do you assure yourself you've done the appropriate level of thinking to not get into an issue where you're sacrificing safety or asset integrity? Uh, the same measures that made you successful at the beginning of the field will make you successful at the end. Um, the technical studies can, uh, can certainly help in doing this, but uh, you've got to be ready to improve your cost structure with less capital and less operating cost. Uh, in this particular instance that we're looking at, you know, how do we minimize the number of uh, visits that we would do to this asset? Understand as well that uh, marginal volumes lead to investment uh, reductions in capital and uh, the company that Tom and I worked with really made a lot of very, very tough decisions about how they were going to manage reservoirs with respect to the initial investments. Stage investments, platform real estate, uh, pad size, all played a really important role into how we decided what we were going to do to move forward. And finally, contracting strategy and leveraging, uh, I noticed in this call, a lot of very qualified contractors. So how do you set up a, a commercial strategy, contracting strategy that allows you to be successful in um, in particular managing end of field life. Um, but the plan's got to focus on a broader range of objectives. Um, and I'll talk about a couple of things right here. And especially in 2021, the ESG, uh, environmental, social, and governance issues are absolutely critical. And I don't think that's news to anybody on this call but there are uh, a number of things that we as industry professionals need to address. Uh, energy needs, and we're a diverse population, this is a diverse and global audience, know that uh, energy needs in different parts of the world are, are paramount and getting uh, affordable energy is absolutely essential to where, where others work. The idea that we're working with an all of the above uh, type of mentality and that we're working responsibly from development to end of field life with assets is absolutely critical as we present our case to society. Um, we have to have rigor in managing activities and that's uh, I think a tie back to exactly what uh, Tom was, uh, was challenging. All right, what Tom was saying is to the work that was done in managing the Gulf of Mexico opportunities and that uh, how do we put uh, a collective challenge around where people spend their time and what they're doing. As Tom said, one of the things that uh, folks really wanted to do was to get away from washing the data and in certain instances that may be a charitable kind of uh, way to, to look at it and there 
many instances we would spend hours kind of challenging the data itself rather than saying we have good data and, and getting it to a point where you really were constructively dealing with the data that you were given and it was data that was valid from the from the beginning of the uh of the uh point of entry so it is it is uh, uh something that requires uh again as i said before a variety of talents and really looks through uh, both technical and commercial uh, and regulatory. This will not be solved you know, solely through a technical and operational lens. Tom, if you could go to the next uh, page. So this is a it's a case study. As I said, it's it's a bit of a composite uh, study, and I've, I've kind of base valence on a on a on a shelf tieback. But uh, in, in what we've done is present a, a waterfall basically to look at I, what I would call each of these are levers that all need to be worked to improve profitability. And as one could look at, uh, see, if you look at the chart on the upper right, um, you basically take this one into uh, a, uh, a situation where it is not profitable, not profitable for anybody. And we needed to work. And when we began to look at this, we said, well, let's just throw everything out on the table, take a look at all of the individual indices and look at what needs to happen to make this work. And where do we go? How do we work this? And so we've talked a little bit about the importance of the regulator. And in this particular instance, uh, to make this project work, uh, we, needed, uh, we needed to suggest the operator royalty relief uh, would be uh, uh, required. And uh, you can see royalty relief illustrated is approximately 4%. Each 1% of royalty reduction equated to uh, about 1% internal rate of return improvement. And um, I, I don't think I need to talk too much uh, to this audience about the difficulties that people have investing in oil and gas for a lot of the reasons we discussed. Uh, investors, especially non-industry investors, folks that are going, for example, to private equity to look at funds, need to be able to uh, rent, say, you know, convincing cases on being able to, uh, to uh, have an overall plan that works for all of the levers uh, that can potentially be used. CapEx reduction uh, has worked. In, in this particular instance, we used uh, we, we pulled out the uh, and suggested that they pull out capital equipment, downsized what we were going to put in, and used rental equipment. Obviously, that's going to have a bump in OPEX, as we've said, but uh, really got us to a point where the tax treatment was a little more favorable, and we were able to basically uh, have some advantage with respect to the initial investments we were asking somebody to come in and do. It did require, uh, in this instance, uh, a, a discussion with the um, uh, regulator on fiscal regimes. It really is always better as well to develop a, uh, a group of the willing to go in and talk. So, um, you know, having, having actually in earlier in my career negotiated uh, marginal fields incentives uh, in different parts, so in one part of the world in particular, it is uh, very, very helpful to be above board uh, and open about what's, uh, what's out there. In this instance, um, it would be most helpful to have a number of operators presenting the case and uh, versus one uh, that, uh, that uh, can be very much more convincing that uh, people would be, uh, would be amenable to doing the work. And that's all premised on the fact that uh, that there has to be real dollars for investment uh, uh, behind that. Uh, we've worked as well in this case, we, we call it a work case where when we did some, some jump or some movement of the numbers, and of course we, we have to leave uh, money for the sovereign, there's gotta be a value proposition for the sovereign. We began to present kind of a negotiated case that uh, began to show money going to the state uh, or money going to the sovereign, employment in the area that the sovereign would work, you know, which is important uh, in any kind of uh, social contract that we would have, but also a return for the investor. So it, it, it really involved opening up the entire uh, gambit of activities, looking at what you could do, 
uh, looking at what ultimate re recovery is, where your investments were, and tailoring how you want to present that, and asking, in this instance, uh, everybody to give up a little to get something across the goal line. Um, and this is the same extension, and the point I make on the bottom, this is the same mentality uh, that you've got. It's really what I would call the challenge of end-of-field life. Um, you know, the regulator, the sovereign wants to assure that every field that's ever out there is properly abandoned and removed, site remediated. Uh, they also want, they have competing uh, competing priorities that, uh, that the field is uh, adequately, reservoirs are adequately depleted and, uh, and the uh, state gets the uh, optimal royalty and tax revenue that, uh, that, they, that they signed up for initially. So it, it involves, uh, these principles involve, I think, uh, uh, very much the same sort of discussions, both in the beginning on a marginal field and at, at the end, end of field life on, on virtually all fields. Tom, if you could go to the final slide. So we'd uh, we'd ask investor, you know, the investors in this instance, uh, can they accept some type of a staged or phased flow of uh, money? And I think folks, and again, I, I know that uh, there's probably 80% of you out there that live this on a daily basis, that you are getting money to come in. And especially when you're bringing in new money, you really want to make sure you're doing everything to assure that your your new investors are getting their return uh, out quickly and in a timely basis uh, and with a preference. Uh, so we had proposed as well in this instance um, an ability to stage cash flow, to have a, a cash flow waterfall that would get new investments out uh, sooner and uh, again would leave uh, others coming in a little bit later. But I think the uh, statement in the in the end uh, is is probably you know the compromise. I hate to use that word, but the, what we're looking for. Um, you've got a, a project that's on top dead center, and it's not moving and it's not going forward. How do you construct and how do you set yourself up as a fair broker to engender the conversation and move this thing uh, forward? So I uh, this was the uh, this is a, a bit of a solution we had proposed uh, to. Uh, to the uh, both potential operators and to the regulators. And uh, uh, again, there's a few cases involved in this. This is not one, one case, but a composite of a few, but a little bit of the mentality that we were, we were trying to push forward is a, is a way to, to make something happen that uh, for all intents and purposes was kind of at full stop. Um, and everybody gets a little bit in the end and it moves everybody forward is kind of a, a part of the all of the above uh, all of the above solutions. So Tom, that's and Susan, that's really what I wanted to say on on this one, and uh, where I wanted to go with the uh, with the slide. And I'll turn it back to you, Susan. Okay, thank you. I think I'm going to take it, and then um, that's great. Uh, thank you for walking through that example. So uh, with that, uh, we have now completed you know sharing uh, both examples. I think we're at the almost at the point of the, the uh, today's webinar uh, of, of entertaining questions. Um, so we'll, we'll uh, conclude by uh, landing on this uh, slide. Uh, and I'll just, you know, so this is the floors flyer, uh, if you will, uh, how, how we advertise ourselves as part of the SEA uh, consultancy, offering those uh, safe, certain, and expert hands around integrated or holistic asset uh, management and performance. Uh, and as Susan already uh, pointed out at the top and is restated here, uh, we, we sort of focus on three uh, core areas of capabilities around uh, stressed asset turnarounds. Uh, and, and Pete just walked you through an example of, of, of some of the work we did in, in that sphere, uh, more of the systemic asset consultancy. So again, uh, more bigger scale, uh, consultancy work uh, uh, and as as we say uh, reshaping uh, operations around uh, or across people process technology and culture uh, that was really the example uh, of the Gulf of Mexico operator uh, where we redressed uh, their approach to integrated asset management 
Uh, obviously, I highlighted the technology aspect of that solution, uh, but there was a, absolutely a people uh, uh, aspect, a process aspect, and a, and a cultural aspect as well. Um, and then finally, expert partnerships, um, uh, more of the hands-on uh, aspect of, uh, of work delivery uh, across a production system, be it inflow related or, or outflow re related. The way we like to uh, think of those three is, you know, number one is all about stopping the bleed, bleeding, whether it's finan financial bleeding or, or operational safety bleeding. Um, uh, uh, number two is really around improving the org uh, organization and its capabilities, uh, if you will, uh, designing that better team, that better organization. And finally, three is around delivering the work, uh, defining and delivering the work. Um, so that's uh, uh, in the realm of integrated asset management of, of how uh, we advertise uh, the, the kind of uh, expert work that we can uh, deliver, again, in partnership with SCA. And uh, at this stage, I'll, I'll just uh, conclude by saying it, it was a delight uh, and certainly uh, uh, thank uh, Susan and her team for allowing us to uh, have the time here uh, today to uh, share uh, some of our work and some of our expertise. And I'll turn it over to Susan now to facilitate, I guess, the Q&A session. Thank <clears throat> Thanks, Tom. We're starting to receive our questions now. And I'd like to remind our listeners, you are muted, so you need to type your questions in the question feature in GoToWebinar, and you will be anonymous. Okay, here's the first question. Oil and gas companies tend to be built around throughput and tax task execution, which relies on expert intuition rather than on a decision framework as you presented. Please expand on specific structural changes you have seen EMP companies make to get away from prioritizing task execution and enable a decision process of continuous improvement. Can you give any examples? And are there specifics in other industries that you can draw upon to help ENPs make this change? Um, so I'll start with, with that. Uh, that's a great question um, on a lot really to unpack there. I think a lot of it uh, speaks to the cultural aspect uh, that has to be addressed in, in um, in, in tackling uh, the problem that I presented or the opportunity uh, that I presented, uh, the willingness uh, for an organization to adopt uh, such a solution, uh, it absolutely requires a shift in mindset uh, to think that um, you know engineers are not artists. It isn't all about intuition and, and gut feel, uh, that, that there is a science uh, to what we're doing and that we can systematize our approach to decision making uh, in, in, in such a way that, you know, I think it fundamentally, uh, re remembering some of these conversations, there are aspects of our collective work, you know, in the engineering domain that can be systematized, right? There are aspects, though, that, that absolutely requires the space for innovation, creativity, uh, uh, developing innovative solutions and understanding what's going on. You know, the first model uh, that you pull uh, off the shelf may not be the right model for that particular problem. Uh, what we found was the organization wasn't getting enough time uh, to do that kind of work. In other words, they were confusing uh, the creative work with the uh, systematized work. And, and the systematized work, you know, I think Pete had the example where, you know, people were, were rewarded uh, in many respects to cleaning up data, to admiring data, to managing data. That's not where value is created, right? The value is created when that data becomes actionable and a decision is made and an action is taken. And so trying to bifurcate the workflows into those things that can be systematized and those things that uh, require more space for creativity absolutely you know is, is a is a big cultural um, discussion that has to be had uh, I'm, I'm trying to think if, if I have any uh, examples not coming uh, immediately top of mind but that was certainly uh, 
this whole notion of, as I said, you know, systematized versus creative work uh, was absolutely a big part of our, our, our dialogue. And we weren't looking, the system wasn't looking to replace, you know, knowledge workers with, with an analytics engine. Uh, but there certainly is space for both. And, and, the, and the more powerful organization is the organization that can adopt analytics in a way to drive rigor uh, and execution to higher and higher levels. I don't know, Pete, if you have any uh, experience from you know, some of the places where you worked on similar solutions you want to add to that. Yeah, um, so I would, uh, I, I'm just, uh, would address it as well. And um, I was working in Brunei when we put a uh, similar uh, organization in the uh, center in place, and we, we called it the Collaboration Center. So we went down that route. Like when we had all of the challenges with data. In this instance, we had 450 gas lift wells that were really high touch. Um, you know, as anybody, everybody knows on this call, working with gas lift wells in a uh, shelf environment, 43 drilling centers, all that entails. It's, it's, a, it's a lot of work. We called it colla a collaboration center. Our goal really was obviously, you know, to get beyond the data discussions and to get into a collaborative environment where everybody got a shot at looking at what was going on and in this instance, we were able to use, uh, you know, a mixture of junior and senior staff. We had some pretty basic processes. We were able to rope in, and I use that in a good way, a lot of the folks who had been silent for a number of years. I mean, we had tremendous opportunities with people, in this instance, offshore, who never were never brought into the dialogue. So we really measured on collaboration. There's a, a discussion on what what kind of industry helped us well we took a lot of this from the automotive industry and you know tom's uh, got quite a bit of background in lean and six sigma you know we had some processes that were you know that were kind of repetitive and, and led themselves uh actually quite nicely to uh to using what was going on in the auto and i think if you look at the provenance of of oil and gas picking up Lean Six Sigma and some of these things. It did start with uh, with the automotive. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, Susan, I'll turn it back to you for another question. You know, we probably didn't uh, we probably didn't do justice to an answer to that. Um, but but the questioner obviously hit on a, a key challenge in 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 tackling uh, the work that we described here this morning. And uh, yeah, you know, um, more dialogue absolutely needed. And and uh, Love the question. Very right. good. Well, here's another good one. Can you comment on the culture angle of the programs to overcome hurdles to that joined up thinking and systematic thinking? Yeah, very good. So it's it's a continuation of the theme around around culture. Um, and uh, 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 say it again, uh, Susan. Can you, at least can you comment on the culture angle of the programs to overcome hurdles to that joined up thinking and systematic thinking yeah joined up yeah yeah exactly what do you do with skeptics? Um, well so so there were so there were absolutely uh, skeptics right there there absolutely were um you know and in each asset um uh, because this because this behavior was enabled and rewarded you know was treated as it's previously had been treated as its own kingdom right so there was you know, asset A's way of, of doing things and how they handled well unloads and so on and so forth. And asset B, you know, had their own, you know, routines that had become well established over years and years and years. Uh, and so, you know, we had to uh, break a lot of that uh, down, absolutely. And, you know, what, what we tried to do to cross pollinate to cross pollinate ideas and reward different types of behavior is, you know, is, is we put sort of uh, two, two things at play. You know, in, in the one hand, we very much wanted to, uh, as Pete described, enable and, and foster collaborative thinking, right? We wanted uh, all of the engineering disciplines to become integrated multidisciplinary teams to be working, on hand, uh, to be working jointly on a problem so that the subsurface part of the problem could be matched with the surface part of the problem. 
you know, so so that the reservoir and geos could be matched up with the facilities and production that you very much wanted to drive that level of integration and collaboration. But at the same time, right, at the same time, we wanted to create and keep uh, and continue to hone the deep technical expertise within each uh, within each uh, discipline, right? So, you know, we wanted production engineers to really uh, think hard about what is what, what are the best well unload procedures, you know, for a certain well type in the Gulf of Mexico, and and you know, reward people that this will become the standard, this will become the best practice that all un on well unloads are kind of measured against, right? So it was a balance of, of trying to um, create tension in, in a creative way uh, amongst our engineering communities, uh, you know, so that we were looking at the problem both horizontally in an integrated manner as well as vertically in a, in a deep technical manner. Hey, Susan, you we've actually had some of this conversation with you previously as well and uh, which is kind of an interesting deal and I would probably be even a little more provocative than that I'd say unless you have the culture right don't worry about any of the other investments uh, unless you start with the culture and make it okay to move forward then you probably aren't going to achieve your results and so uh, um, you know, there is a thing. You, you got to go, go slow to go fast with people, and you got to bring people around. And uh, uh, that's a, uh, you know, that was clearly what we had found in in Brunei, and it was kind of creating this cohesion around a group of people with common objectives, and making it okay to have the dialogue that ultimately led us to be really successful in our collaboration center. No, absolutely, absolutely agree with that. And there was a lot of, you know, I'm trying to remember what we called these sessions, but there were a lot of, you know, brainstorming sessions, seeking to understand the current ways of working, uh, and and looking toward how we wanted to how, how we wanted to drive this in the future. Uh, and and you know, if 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 the culture is going to be a stumbling block, you know, then all the investment in the technology, in the analytics, in in the in, in the you know video screens and everything else that they they make for pretty pictures and, and a brochure uh, but you're not going to get any value out of it let me address this next question to Pete do you find resistance to introducing real-time workflows is due to our perception of taking my job possibly due to the fact that the benefits of turning data to information from which decisions can be made was not communicated clearly well, I don't know. I, you know, I, I have not seen it employed as such. Uh, so, uh, I mean, my my real world experience and looking at AI and, and where things are going is that uh, that's not been the the end result for me. Uh, what what we really tried to do and what we've tried to do in a lot of these things is create a value proposition for people who are going to be participating in it, Susan. In other words, um, joining on board means that you're going to get a lot more exposure and a lot more cap uh, capability to work some of the harder issues. Um, when we did our work, we never looked at it as kind of a head count exercise. We looked at it as a way to bolster the overall competence of our group. And again, it starts with the culture. And that really meant, and I like what Tom was saying, you know, I have found in my kind of being in this business 40 years, there will be people who will look at something and intuitively know whether it's right. Um, there will be people on the other end of the spectrum, um, you know, again, in the confines of this training center who really don't have that exposure. When you can create an environment where those wise and folks who have done this for a number of years, uh, can work with some staff who, who gen, you know, generally will benefit from that, and, and vice versa. By the way, there's there's a lot that uh, goes in both directions. We'd always really set it up as a value proposition, and it starts by going in there with that as as the end in mind. 
Great. Next question. Is it difficult to justify the investment in instrumentation and automation in exchange of more time for the engineers to optimize based on the data they are getting, specifically in unconventional assets? In, in uh, that was specific to unconventional assets. Unconventional assets, yes. Right. Um, that, I mean that that, that is that, that is a, a, a challenge. I, I wouldn't call it a challenge. I mean it, that is a question that inevitably comes up. Uh, you know, can we can we make the uh, you know can we justify uh, additional uh, instrumentation, et cetera, et cetera? You know, can we make the argument to go to edge uh, computing versus on-prem, blah, blah. Uh, absolutely. Um, it, our approach generally was, uh, you know, when, when we introduced the solution, and, and even the time I spent uh, with, with a large onshore operator where we had a, uh, a production center and a, and a well delivery center, um, our, our fundamental starting point was we're not going to make any investment in new instrumentation the first thing we're going to do you know so, so our phased implementation of the solution would start with leveraging all of the existing data that was already being instrumented and coming into our systems how can we make better use more efficient use more effective use using you know more sophisticated analytics techniques to surface uh, anomalies in in the performance and what we typically found was we were not taking advantage of even the ex e e e our existing measurements right our existing measurement system or existing data streams if they were disparate they were in different um, you know organizationally the geo data was over here in this you know environment and then your reservoir data was in a different environment production data and so inevitably what we you know just taking everything that we already had and connecting it up and then putting analytics on top of that we would always be able to prove uh value from that and then if we needed to augment that with additional instrumentation we were already well on the journey and so that's generally how we approached it thank you well we're at the top of the hour so we thank everyone for their questions today if you submitted any questions that we didn't get to, around to we'll make sure tom and pete have a chance to address those in email to you later. Um, later today, you will receive a link to a recording of today's webinar that you can share with your colleagues. If they missed it, perhaps you'll get an evaluation form and a link to more information on mentoring and consulting services with SCA. Tom, Pete, thanks for your presentation today. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Goodbye. Thank you.